failures as we forgive those who have sinned and committed faults and and have failed us our strong God we ask that you would continue to lead and guide us in the way that you would have us to go help us to lean not to our own understanding but in all our ways acknowledge you help us to trust you every step of the way we ask that you would cleanse us and heal us from 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 sickness in our body sickness in our heart sickness in our mind sickness in our community sickness in our churches sickness in our family sickness in the earth we un understand that you are still able to heal if we can have it, you can heal it. And so we ask that you would heal us of whatever ails us and help us to, to walk in the newness. Help us to walk in our healing. Help us to give you glory and praise and honor for our healing. We pray. We pray that you would bless our children as summertime has started and 
children are out of school and parents are working children many instances are unsupervised and we pray that you would keep them safe from danger seen and unseen we pray that they will have resources and opportunities to be engaged in some positive and productive activities and our strong God we pray that you would help the church help those of us who call upon you to be your light in this dark world help us to represent you in all that we say and all that we do in public and in private Lord we love you we ask that you would have your way in this worship experience bless our time together bless everyone that is tuned in everyone who will watch or hear this worship we pray that you would bless us individually and collectively with the blessings we stand in the need of and oh God we'll be ever so careful to give you all the praise to give you all the glory and all the honor it's in Jesus name that we pray and ask these blessings and all who love the Lord and agree with this prayer said amen amen and amen come on and put those blessed hands together and give God praise in this place Oh, we go. 
for me.
say for me for me now come on and give god glory hallelujah Oh, come on. If you know things will work out, go on and give him praise. Even if it hadn't worked out, because you know God is able to work it out, you can go on and give him some praise knowing that it will work out. That's why Paul said, all things work together for the good, for those who love the Lord. And who are the call according to his purpose. Now I got a question for you. Do you love the Lord? Are you called according to his purpose? Well go ahead and give him praise. Because it's going to work out. I need you to know that. Try your weeping out. Because it's going to work out. Give God praise. Hallelujah. I'm glad that it's going to work out. That situation that you've been losing sleep over, it's going to work out. That situation that caused you to have ulcers, it's going to work out. That situation that caused you to cry yourself to sleep, it's going to work out. Go ahead and give God praise because it's going to work out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, thank you. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Gracious God, we thank you. We thank you that it's going to work out. We thank you for the truth that is going to work out. Help us to know that if you brought us to it, that you'll bring us through it that is going to work out. We thank you. We thank you for your promise that all things work together for our good. And now our strong God, we pray as we prepare to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ that you would empower me and enable me by your spirit to preach not with enticing words of my wisdom but in a demonstration of your Holy Spirit and power to help us to know that it will work out give us receptive hearts and minds that we might receive your word with gladness to the end that you and you alone are glorified and magnified the saints are edified and multiplied. The Satan is horrified and petrified. And sinners would become justified. It's in Jesus' mighty and matchless name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Come on and put those blessed hands together for the praise team. The musicians. Now put your hands together and give God praise for you and your family. My grandfather would say that it's a poor dog that won't wag its own tail. Amen. Amen. Yes, I am in shorts again. It's summertime. Amen. Amen. The fish are jumping. Amen. Amen. I bet you some of you got on shorts while you're listening and watching me. Amen. So don't look at me in that tone of voice. Amen. God bless you. If you have your Bibles or your copy of the Word of God, would you go with us on this first Sunday of June? Would you go with us to the the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 11. 2 Corinthians, chapter 11. And I'm going to begin reading at verse 12. Verse 12 of 2 Corinthians, chapter 11. I'll be 
begin my reading and I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version of God's Word. And if you're physically able where you are, would you stand in honor of the Word of God? 2 Corinthians 12, I'm sorry, 11, beginning at verse 12. And what I do, I will continue to do in order to deny an opportunity to those who want an opportunity to be recognized as our equals in what they boast about. For such boasters are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is not strange if his ministers also disguise themselves as ministers of righteousness, their end will match their deeds. Sisters and brothers, for the next few moments that I ask to share, I simply want to talk to you from this thought, identity theft. Let the church say, type, text, identity theft. Sisters and brothers, identity theft is the fastest growing crime in the world. Last year, there were over 10 million victims of identity theft, which means that every minute 20 people were a victim of this crime. This crime has cost over a billion dollars in losses to consumers and corporations last year alone. Identity theft is a crime that involves taking someone else's identity to obtain credit and credit cards from banks and retailers in someone else's name who is credit worthy with the intent of running up the bill and not being responsible, responsible for repaying the debt. The person whose identity is stolen is usually not aware until they try to apply for credit themselves or use the credit that they have only to discover that they no longer qualify or have the credit that they once had because identity thieves have taken their name and done activity in their name without paying the bill. Identity thieves steal money from victims' existing accounts, apply for loans, establish new accounts, rent apartments, purchase cars, and a plethora of other fraudulent activities which ruins the victim's credit and their good name. Identity theft is a major problem in our society. But my brothers and sisters, I think I ought to tell you that identity theft is not a new crime. Identity theft didn't start in the 20th and 21st centuries. No, my brothers and sisters, the first incident of identity theft happened in a garden called Eden. For it was there that Eve was beguiled or tricked by the devil. But he didn't come in a red suit with a pitchfork. He didn't come with a name tag that said Satan, uh, the adversary. He, he didn't come saying... Uh, I am the mortal enemy of God Almighty and destroyer of humankind. No, the first identity thief came in the form of a serpent and pretended to have Eve's best interest at heart. You know the story. Identity theft may be a new crime from an economic standpoint, but it's not new from a spiritual perspective because Satan has been stealing identities for a long time. I just read to you in the 14th chapter, I mean, it's the 14th verse of this chapter that says Satan himself transforms into an angel of light. And the reason that he does this is for a couple of things. Number one, he wants to ruin God's credit. Satan is out to destroy God's good name. See, Satan knows if he can ruin God's credit, then we won't trust God. We won't believe that God would do what he said he'll do and therefore we won't seek him or his kingdom because Satan has ruined God's credit with us. But not only does Satan seek to ruin God's credit, 
he also seeks to ruin God's creation. You see, if he's able to ruin God's credit with you and I and cause us not to trust God, then we'll put our trust in other things and other people who can't do for us what God can. The songwriter writer said, can't nobody do me like Jesus and can't nobody do me like the Lord. But when Satan is successful at ruining God's credit, with us then no longer do we sing can't nobody do me like Jesus but we start singing songs like do it do it do it until you're satisfied or maybe you say like Mick Jagger I can't get no satisfaction but the devil is not the only person who steals identities we have some people in the church who steal identities and instead of keeping it real and saying I don't have it all together all my eyes are not dotted and all my T's are not crossed but I'm trying every day to live in a more perfect and pleasing way we have people walking around as if they are perfect Christians acting like their stuff doesn't stink like they've never had any gastrointestinal activity before they act like uh, they don't have any mistakes or missteps in their life anymore. They look down their nose at those of us who, are, who, who still ain't where we want to be, but thank God we ain't where we used to be. I, I think I ought to tell you that God is looking for true worshipers to worship him in spirit and in truth. He's not looking for fake folk. He's not looking for pseudo-righteous. Think you're righteous when you ain't righteous. God is looking for people who will keep it real because when you keep it real you realize that you still have room for growth and improvement and that you can't do anything worthwhile by yourself but when you start thinking that you're all that you think you can do it all by yourself nobody can tell you anything because you know everything and when you start thinking like this you're a prime candidate to be a victim of spiritual identity theft because you feel like it can't happen to you. And I think I ought to tell you a little about the background of the place and the people of Corinth. Corinth was not an inconsequential city in an obscure area with no significance. No, Corinth was about 48 miles southwest of Athens, Greece. It was a major port city. And it rivaled Athens and Thebes in wealth. It was a natural stopping point for sea captains and merchants. It was of great commercial importance because of its location. And it was the most important city in Greece at the time of our text. Corinth's great temple on its ancient Acropolis uh, was dedicated to Aphrodite and had over a thousand uh, temple prostitutes in its employ. Corinth had it going on uh, so much so that a form of architecture that was developed there came to be synonymous with wealth uh, because it was the most difficult of the three classical architectures of the day and it came to be known as the Corinthian order. Corinth had a famous saying associated with it at this time, O Pantus Plain S. Corinthon, which translates as not everyone is able to go to Corinth. It was in this cosmopolitan city and atmosphere that the Apostle Paul was ministering in. And his letters to the church at Corinth reflect the difficulties they faced in maintaining a Christian community in such a cosmopolitan city. It was the church at Corinth, if you remember, that thought themselves as super Christians because they could speak in tongue and were having all of these ecstatic experiences. But their problem was not that they had the gifts, but that they were forgetting the giver of the gifts. When you forget the giver of the gifts, you start to think that it's by your power and your might uh, that you're able to do what you do. And then you start saying, like the hip hop song says, I bet you can't do it like me because you've forgotten that without the grace of God you wouldn't have the gift that you have that you're operating in and my brothers and sisters you'll start thinking that God owes you something instead of realizing that you owe God 
everything. And so the question that we must answer is this. How do we recognize the real from the fake? How do we protect ourselves, unlike the church at Corinth, from being victims of identity theft? Well, I believe that this text is tailored to teach us just how to recognize these wolves in sheep's clothing. And the first thing that I see in the text that ought to sound our spiritual alarms is the fact that they preached another Savior. Uh, travel back up with me to verse 4 of this 11th chapter of 2 Corinthians. Paul says that if, that, that if, he, if someone comes to you and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, I think I ought to tell you what was happening in Corinth was these false prophets were coming in and preaching another Jesus. Now the text is ambiguous as to what they were preaching about Jesus, but some scholars believe that they were preaching a form of Gnosticism, which took on many forms of which all denied the physical uh, because the, the, denied the physical Jesus because Gnostics believed that the flesh was inherently evil. But John, scholars believe, was refuting uh, Gnosticism in his book because in the first chapter, in the first verse, John starts his book off saying, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. Then he drops down to verse 14 in the same chapter and says, uh, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father. We touched, we handled his flesh. My brothers and sisters, these people were preaching a different Jesus. And I think I ought to tell you that what you believe about Jesus is important. It's so important that Jesus polled his disciples one day and said, Whom do men say that I am? The disciples said, Some say you're John the Baptist, and some say you're Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. But then Jesus looks at his disciples. First he wanted to know, What do other folks say? About me, but then he polls his disciples, those who profess to, to be his, and he says, Who do you say I am? Because, sisters and brothers, it's important what you believe and what you say about Jesus. And just like folk back then were preaching a different Jesus, we have folk today who are preaching a different Jesus. The Muslims say Jesus was a prophet, but not the son of God. The Hindus' beliefs vary, with some saying he was normal, some saying he was a fable or a myth, some saying he was a wise guru, uh, but not divine, nor the son of the divine. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus was not God, but that he was God's first creations. Mormons believe that Jesus and Satan are spirit brothers. Some folk don't believe anything about Jesus. It's important what you believe about Jesus. No disrespect to any religion or faith that is different from my own, but when you start telling me that Jesus ain't who Jesus said he was, then you are preaching a different savior. If you tell me that Jesus wasn't God in the flesh, that Jesus wasn't God's selfie, uh, then you're preaching a different savior. When you try to put Muhammad and Jesus on the same level, you are preaching a different savior. But my brothers and sisters, it shouldn't surprise us that other religions will preach another Jesus. But we have people in the church who preach a different Jesus. There's a theology going around that says that uh, Jesus was rich. And that if we have a relationship with him, that we're supposed to be rich too. That all of us are supposed to live in whatever kind of house we want and, 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 and drive whatever kind of car we want and, and have whatever uh, material possession that we want. That we are supposed to name it and claim it, blab it and grab it, call it. 
and haul it. But Jesus, out of his own mouth, said foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. He wasn't born in the four seasons of Bethlehem, but he was born in a stable and laid in a manger. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like Jesus was rich to me. And, and, and if Jesus was rich, then why? And if we're supposed to be rich, then why did he uh, say in Matthew's gospel that we'll have the poor with us always? Why did Luke record that he said, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Not blessed are the poor. For they shall be rich or blessed are the rich for theirs is the kingdom of God. When they say those things, they are preaching a different Jesus. They say that if you're in a relationship with Jesus, that you won't get sick. But the 11th chapter of John's gospel uh, tells a different story. Because Jesus' friend, whom he loved by the name of Lazarus, not only got sick, but he died. So just because you have a, a relationship with Jesus doesn't mean you won't have sickness in your body. Doesn't mean that you won't have pain, that you won't have heartache and heartbreak, that you won't have challenges with your money. My brothers and sisters, uh, they are preaching a different Jesus because guess what? If Jesus doesn't return soon and very soon, all of us are going to die one day. My brothers and sisters, they were preaching a different Jesus. Some of them are preaching Jesus as a cosmic bellhop who is at our beck and call and, and will give us everything that we ask for like a genie in a bottle. But the Bible shows us a different Jesus than the one they preached because when Mary and Martha, uh, the, sister, the sisters of Lazarus, sent Jesus a text message telling him to come quick, they hit him up in the DM and said, come quick, uh, your friend whom you love is sick. Jesus didn't come quick. Matter of fact, the text says that he stayed where he was two more days. He didn't jump up like a, a genie in a bottle or a cosmic bellhop, but he stayed where he was two more days. If the devil can get you to believe that Jesus is a cosmic bellhop or a genie in a bottle who fulfills your request, then he can ruin God's credit with you if God doesn't do what you ask him to do because you'll believe that God has failed you. And when you say that God has failed you, then you're preaching a different Jesus. Uh, but when you know the truth, you can say that he's never failed me yet. And the saints of old knew that Jesus wasn't a cosmic bellhop. That's why they would say he may not come when you want him, but he's always on time. But my brothers and sisters, not only did they preach another savior, but secondly, the text teaches us about these identity thieves is that they present another spirit. We still in verse four. Verse four says, uh, for if he comes, preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, uh, which you have not received. Uh, my brothers and sisters, the, uh, these false prophets and false teachers were uh, presenting another spirit and the folk in Corinth uh, were receiving another spirit. Uh, they were given the Holy Spirit when they came uh, to Christ by faith. And they began in the spirit. And now they seemingly want to try to finish without the spirit. But I think I need to tell you that you and I can't do nothing without the spirit. It's the spirit who enables and empowers us to live the Christian life. And if we receive another spirit, we won't have the power needed not only to live the Christian life, but to complete the assignment that God has given for us to complete. My brothers and sisters, the problem with many of us is that we've received a different spirit. Some of us have received a spirit of fear. Some of us are so afraid of failing that we fail 
to try believing that if we don't try then we can't fail but you can fail your children by not trying to parent them uh, instead you are trying to be their friend but I think I need to tell you that our children have enough friends they don't need any new friends but they don't have enough parents and my brothers and sisters, we are so afraid uh, that they won't like us, so we try to be their friends. Some of us have re uh, received a spirit of fear that we are afraid to trust God with our lives because we're afraid that it, he'll cramp our style or steal our swag. Like life won't be fun anymore. But I don't know about you, but life didn't truly become fun until uh, I, I gave my life to, call, to, to Christ, to God through Christ. It, it ain't fun worrying about where your next meal is coming from or if you're going to be able to pay your bills. But when you're a child of God, your testimony is like that of the psalmist. I, I've been young and now I'm older and I've never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging for bread. It ain't no fun being preyed upon and hated on by folk who want to see you fail and fall. But when you belong to God, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And if you got enemies, guess what? He'll prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. It's fun to feast while your enemies are famished and they can't do nothing about your feast. Some of us have received the spirit of by any means necessary. Well, we don't care what it takes uh, to what we have to do to accomplish our goals. Whether those goals are spiritual or secular, we'll do whatever it takes right or wrong, good or bad. These are the ones who will try to turn over a free and fair election but claim to stand for truth but they're promoting a big lie. These are the ones who claim to love God but would do anything under the sun if they think it would get them what they want. These are the people who put citizens who elected them to office in harm's way by downplaying a pandemic and sending them out like sheep to the slaughter because they put profit over people. These are the people who will lie, cheat, steal, or even kill if they think it will get them what they want. And if you're compromising your ethics and morals to get what you think you want or need, then you've received a different spirit. Stop listening to folk who try to present a different spirit and listen to the spirit of truth who you receive when you first believe. You don't have to receive a different spirit because greater is he that is within you than he that is in the world. But my brothers and sisters, not only do these identity thieves preach another savior and present another spirit but thirdly and finally, these identity thieves proclaim another story. We're still in verse 4. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaim, or if you received a different spirit from the one you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, my brothers and sisters, these wolves in sheep's clothing have preached another Jesus. They presented a different spirit and now they're proclaiming another story. You do understand that the gospel, the story of Jesus that Paul preached was the story of Jesus Christ. But the ministers of Satan were preaching another story. They were telling a different gospel. Paul said in Romans chapter 1 that he wasn't ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God. My brothers and sisters, unto salvation. And that word for power in the Greek is the Greek word dunamis from which we get the English word dynamite because the gospel of Jesus Christ is the dynamite of God which removes the burdens and destroys our yokes. It is the dynamite of God that sets the captives free. 
it is the dynamite of God that blows through all the hurt and pain of our existence to reveal the love of God for all mankind. The gospel of Jesus Christ is so special that those who preach it are said to have pretty feet. Romans 10, 15 says, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Satan wants a, a different gospel preached so there won't be any power and if there's no power then he can continue to wreak havoc in our lives but Jesus said that he's given us power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the works of the devil my brothers and sisters if you know the Savior have the spirit and know the story you won't be a victim of spiritual identity theft I used to work in the banking industry and whenever we hired new tellers they would be trained on how to recognize counterfeit money now you would think my brothers and sisters that they would have made them so familiar with the counterfeit that they would have pointed all the things on the counterfeit bill that was wrong because you understand this was before the counterfeit pins were available but my brothers and sisters the banks didn't expose the tellers to the counterfeit bill to train them to spot a counterfeit my brothers and sisters they trained them to spot real money they made them so familiar with the real thing that they could spot a counterfeit bill a mile away and that's how it is for you and I we need to be so familiar with the real thing that when they preach another savior when they present another spirit or proclaim another story we can spot it a mile away and tell them like the songwriter said you can't make me doubt it why because i know too much about it give god praise if you know him for yourself you need to make sure that you know the savior that you have the spirit and that you know the story because if you know the savior if you know the story and you have the spirit then you won't be a victim to spiritual identity theft you'll be able to make it no matter how dark the night because you know the savior you've got the spirit and and you know the story hell can't get you like it wants to when you know the savior you got the spirit and you know the story you don't have to be depressed when you got the savior you got the spirit and you know the story you know that everything will work out when you know the savior you got the spirit and you know the story can you give God praise because you know the Savior you've got the spirit and you know the story and since you know the Savior you know that he'll never leave you nor forsake you you know he's got all power in his hands you know my brothers and sisters that he'll meet and supply your every need you know that weeping may endure for a night but joy comes in the morning and since you've got the spirit you're able to leap over walls you're able to speak to your mountains by faith and say be thou removed because you've got the spirit you're able to smile when you feel like crying because you've got the spirit even when you're hurting yourself you're a blessing to somebody else my brothers and sisters and because you know the story you know that one Friday he went up on Calvary's cross my brothers and sisters and died for your sins and mine but because you know the story you know he didn't stay dead but early on Sunday morning got up with all power 
in his hands. But what does that mean, preacher? That he got up with all power. It means that since he got up, you and I will get up. We can get up existentially here and now, and we'll get up eschatologically then when we die. But my brothers and sisters, give God praise because you know the Savior. You've received the Spirit, and you know the story because everything will be all right. All things work together for the good of them who love God and that are called according to his purpose. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank God for sending his son that he loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe on him won't perish but have everlasting life. Listen, don't be a victim of identity theft. Get so familiar with the real thing that you're able to spot a counterfeit a mile away. God bless you for your time. I'm out of mind. Did our hearts not burn as the word of God was shared with us? The word of God declares that his word shall not return unto him void, but it shall accomplish that which he purposed. And we know that if you don't have a relationship with God the Father, through God the Son, that the purpose of that word was to invite you to that relationship. And it's as simple as A, B, C. A, admit that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. Believe that Jesus is the Son of the living God. That he lived the life that we should have lived and died the death that we deserve to die. But that God raised him from the dead. And then C, confess that belief with your mouth. It's as simple as A, B, C. And if you do that, the Bible declares that you shall be saved. That you are saved. And if you made that declaration and that decree today, would you comment in the chat and let us know, would you? Send us an email or give us a call so that we can celebrate with you your new relationship with God the Father through God the Son. We praise God for you and we thank God for you. As you get your, your elements ready so that we can commemorate and celebrate the death of the Lord Jesus Christ until he comes. For on the night in which Christ was betrayed, he and the disciples were in what the Bible calls the upper room. And the Bible says that Jesus took the bread, he blessed it, and then he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. As often as as you eat, you eat it in remembrance of me. Church of the living God, let us all eat together. And likewise, when he had took the cup and supped, he said, this is my blood, which is shed for you. It's the seal of the New Testament. And as often as you drink it, you drink it in remembrance of me. Church of the living God, let us all drink together. Now when they finished, they went out into a garden. And we're not going out into a garden, but into a mean, cruel world. And so I want to encourage you to take the Lord with you everywhere you go. Gracious God, we, we thank you for the privilege to fellowship to praise and worship your holy name, to commemorate and celebrate the sacrifice that you made on Calvary's cross to save sinners like us. So we thank you for our communion. We thank you and ask that you would bless us individually and collectively. 
with the blessings that we stand in the need of. We thank you, O oh God, for the privilege to worship you through giving. We ask that you will bless both the gift and the giver, that both will be used for the furtherance and the upbuilding of your kingdom. And we know we can't beat you giving no matter how hard we try. And so for that, we're thankful. Now, our strong God, we ask that you will continue to bless us and keep us, continue to make your face to shine upon us, and continue to be gracious unto us. Continue to lift up your countenance upon us and grant us your peace, a peace that the world did not give and therefore the world cannot take away, a peace that surpasses all understanding, and a peace that will guard our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus. Now may trouble neglect us. May our neighbors respect us. And may angels protect us. And when you call, may heaven accept us. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. I love you.